About one in four people arrested in America suffer from both severe mental illness and drug or alcohol abuse. The bigger problem might well be the people with mental illness who aren't arrested. People like Floyd, a clinically depressed 64-year-old homeless man with broken ribs, sleeping on the bench of a picnic table in a Texas park. I even thought about killing myself. You thought about killing yourself? Yeah. Yeah, have you had those thoughts today? Mm Mm-hmm. How would you do it? That's Ken Bennett, the mental health coordinator for the police departments in the sister cities of Hearst, Euless, and Bedford, Texas. They've been talking with Floyd for less than five minutes, and they're asking how he wants to kill himself. Tell a cop you're suicidal, and they need to determine whether you have a plan, if you've really thought about it. I thought about hanging myself. Yeah? Thought about hanging yourself today, Floyd? Yeah. Just kind of tired of it? Sick of the amount of it. Okay. All right, we can get you some help that way. This is the kind of thing that people say they want police to do. All too often, we don't. We can't. Most agencies don't have a culture that supports this kind of thing. At one point during the, during the incident, the confrontation, he even brought the gun down from his head and racked around into the chamber right in front of us. That's my friend Colt, who resigned as a mental health peace officer this month. My name's Colt Remington, and I'm a former police officer in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Yeah, his name really is Colt Remington. Colt is a former Marine sergeant who served in Iraq and Afghanistan, and he's telling me about one of the times he convinced a suicidal man with a gun to his head to put the gun down and come get some help. And all our voices are escalating at the same time, like, oh, I dropped the gun! And it got really, really tense, and it, you could almost hear all of the slack coming out of the triggers from the guns from all the officers that are around us. Somehow, he ends up taking the magazine out, putting the gun down, and gives up. That's Colt being modest. The somehow was that Colt talked to him for about 15 minutes despite the gun being loaded, cocked, and so close to him, and the man finally agreed to get help. Afterwards, supervisors who watched the video told Colt that he should have shot the guy, that it was dangerous that he hadn't shot the guy. But the craziest part about that is rather than coming up and being like, hey, great job for not killing a guy, it was, well, why didn't you shoot him? You know, you should have shot this guy. That's insane. The thing is... The way mental health care in America works right now, both of them are right. The supervisor was right. Just because somebody's mentally ill doesn't mean they're not going to kill you. The man threatening suicide was a criminal and he had stolen the gun. And Colt was right. Usually, Graham v. Connor, the Supreme Court ruling applied to cops who use deadly force, is something we hear about when the cop pulled the trigger. The ruling says that the reasonableness of a particular use of force must be judged from the perspective of a reasonable officer on the scene rather than with the 2020 vision of hindsight. But here's a case in which we have Colt, the officer, saying that to him, with his battlefield and gunfight experience, he didn't feel his life was in danger. He didn't need to shoot. His supervisor can't just look at the video and say Colt should have shot the guy because that's exactly the kind of Monday morning quarterbacking the rule bars. This is one of the biggest challenges in America. Most departments are training, like Colt's old agency, in a reactive manner. More progressive agencies are now using something called the Memphis Model or Crisis Intervention Training. Through state-mandated courses for police officers, I've taken about 24 hours of CIT training, and it's dramatically better than nothing. I'm sure it saves lives. But the thing I keep thinking about is that for the training to be helpful, you need a crisis. If you're like me, you grew up thinking that America was a great, somewhat flawed, but fundamentally fair country. I always believed that if you're truly mentally ill, you'll be cared for in a community mental health center or a county or state hospital. I'm old enough to not only remember, but to have gone to the Soviet Union, where the mentally ill were imprisoned. We're not like that, right? Our jail population this morning was 4,100, and 25% of those people are mental health patients of some sort. They're verifiable on mental health uh, meds. They are being counseled and dealt with as if they, well, they are mental health issues. Meet my old boss. I'm Sheriff Bill Wayburn of Tarrant County, Texas. Tarrant County is Fort Worth and the cities to the east and west of it, which are home to about two million people. So he's saying that this morning, more than a thousand people in the county jail in Fort Worth are mentally ill jail inmates. That's about average. Yeah, this is the kind of problem whose scale just sneaks up on most people. There are 10 times more people with serious mental illnesses in America's prisons and jails than in state mental hospitals. Some of our nation's biggest psychiatric inpatient clinics are in county jails in Chicago, Los Angeles, and New York. I guess this shouldn't shock people, but I know it does because they tell me it does. 
Part of this is probably because we in law enforcement are incredibly bad at communicating important trends like this. Don't get me wrong, cops will gripe. But it's not in our nature to complain about the mission. And mental health has become a big part of the mission. And it's not like we didn't say anything at all. If you remember the attack on Dallas police officers in July of 2016, you probably remember the words of then-Dallas Police Chief David Brown. We're asking cops to do too much in this country. Not enough mental health funding. Let the cop handle it. Not enough drug addiction funding. Let's give it to the cops. On the other hand, we have activists and citizens rightfully demanding to know how things can go so wrong between cops and the mentally ill. In Oklahoma City this September, officers fatally shot a man who was deaf and mentally ill after he refused to drop a two-foot pipe and get on the ground. How could that have happened? What about de-escalation training? Where's the mental health awareness training? What do those terms even mean? Like many things at the intersection of law enforcement, citizens, and the news, mental health policing is complicated. So let's untangle it, starting with why police and the mentally ill intersect so often. And then we'll hit the streets with officers and the Behavioral Intervention Unit, what just might be America's most progressive, proactive mental health unit. What I'm about to say really seems to surprise a lot of people. Today's mental health situation in America is the result of cuts by Republican and Democratic administrations over the past 50 years. No party, no politician, no individual policy is to blame. It's a bipartisan mess of good intentions and terrible planning, of lofty ideals meeting government budgetary reality. And it all starts with chlorpromazine. Back in the 1950s, when the average stay in a mental asylum was about 11 years, a common treatment was an orbital lobotomy in which surgeons would cut the connection from the brain to the prefrontal cortex. And you got to remember, this was going on even in the 60s all the way up until the 70s. So this wasn't something that, was, that happened, uh, you know, 80, 90 years ago. I mean, this is a very recent thing that we were doing. That's Ken Bennett again. But in 1955, they came out with a drug called Thorazine, and they thought this drug Thorazine was going to be the cure-all. Thorazine is the best-known brand name for chlorpromazine. What it promised was something like a chemical lobotomy. Patients who had been impossible to handle could finally be deinstitutionalized. As long as they took their meds, they could be sent back home. It was a miracle, and we needed one. Almost every American family at some stage will experience or has experienced a case of mental affliction. And we have to offer something more than crowded custodial care in our state institutions. Our task is to treat them more effectively and sympathetically in the patient's own community. The Kennedy administration began the push to get mental patients out of the asylums and drive them toward local and community clinics, which the president said would be more effective and humane. The Community Mental Health Act, signed the month before his assassination, was to provide funding to states to build 1,500 community health centers. But the launch of Medicaid in 1965 created a perverse effect. It wanted to bolster the incentive to states to get people into those local community clinics that would receive federal funding. But that funding never fully materialized, and it has been cut and cut ever since. Medicaid, which was to be the health care safety net for indigent and poor Americans, just never wanted to cover mental health costs. But state budgets, then as now, presume that Medicaid does. In 1980, the Carter administration passed the Mental Health Systems Act, which sought to expand community mental health centers' remit to handle substance abuse disorders. But Carter lost his re-election bid. For the second time in 17 years, a president signed broad legislation to introduce change to American mental health treatment, but he couldn't follow through. Reagan-era austerity and tax cut policies led Congress to cut federal mental health funding significantly. And as asylum conditions worsened, suits to protect the rights of the mentally ill resulted in rulings across the country against involuntary commitment without a specific and articulable danger to the patient or others. The budget cuts opened the floodgates, sending millions in an exodus from mental hospitals to streets and parks. And the contemporary homelessness problem was upon us. For years now, our mental health system has struggled to serve people who depend on it. That's why, under the Affordable Care Act, we're expanding mental health and substance abuse benefits for more than 60 million Americans. New health insurance plans are required to cover things like depression screens for adults and behavioral assessments for children. And beginning next year, insurance companies will no longer be able to deny anybody coverage because of a pre-existing mental health condition. President Obama spoke there about major advances in mental health care, but they referred primarily to regulation of private insurers, not mental health care for the indigent. Phrases like Medicaid match, trans-institutionalization, and other government gobbledygook were euphemisms for reduced care and, perhaps worst, 
a wild differential in state hospitalization rates based on how your state plays the game. With some ups and downs, every president since Johnson cut more of the funding. And with no funding for hospitals and a homeless population rife with mental illness, self-medication, and desperate poverty, jails have become America's largest mental health providers. The reality is that police, not a doctor, not a social worker, cops, are the first responders to mentally ill people in America. The hospitals are full, and there's no other way to get around it unless we want to build more hospitals. It seems like we're okay building more jails. Ken runs a behavioral intervention unit that's made up of a coordinator, him, and a cadre of patrol officers now certified as Texas mental health peace officers. He's about 6'3", 245 pounds, about 45, and he's wearing a polo shirt and tactical pants. I asked him about the clothes. He said that they gave him a choice of slacks, button-down shirt, and dress shoes, or this. He chose this because sometimes he does have to scuffle. The BIU does a mental health patrol each weekday, with officers and clinicians working together as a team, patrolling the neighborhoods. They have a list of people with mental illnesses, they call them clients, and the BIU drives around and checks in on them, makes sure that they're on their meds or keeping their appointments. Sometimes this means driving them to the clinic or to a homeless shelter. Ken says there are about 6,000 people in his community who act exactly the way the Community Mental Health Act envisioned. They're treatment compliant, they keep their appointments, they're doing great. Those aren't Ken's clients. For the small population of clients that we're dealing with, these clients are not treatment compliant. They're not med compliant, and they might have a history at a local MHMR clinic, but they're no longer in services. So now what's happening? They're coming in contact with law enforcement. In Hearst, Eulis, and Bedford, H-E-B, the purpose of the BIU when it was founded three years ago was to increase jail diversion, bringing people with minor charges who didn't really need to be in jail to mental health services instead of jail. I think it's worth noting how far ahead of the curve these cities have been. The BIU is an expansion of a program begun almost a decade ago as the Hearst Crisis Intervention Team Model, a joint effort between MHMR, the agency, and Hearst PD. To accomplish its mission, BIU officers need to know the community and to be able to step in during situations in which regular patrol officers might not be an ideal first responder. What they aren't looking to do is diagnose. The officers aren't permitted to do that. But they are gathering what are known as diagnostic impressions, articulable facts and observations of a trained officer to be communicated to a mental health professional. Here's Officer Casey Sanders, a mental health peace officer assigned to the ULIS BIU. If they're very quiet and they're very flat, affect, we can probably determine they're depressed. If we're talking to them about uh, the weather and they start talking about the Pope and black ops, or we might say you know, their thoughts are disorganized. Casey's about 6'3", fit, bald, with a trimmed mustache, and impeccably turned out in his uniform. He's what cops call squared away. If he got out of the car when you got pulled over, you know you're getting a ticket. I'd tell you he looks like a cop from Central Casting, but in fact, he looks and even sounds a little like Michael O'Neill, who played Secret Service agent Ron Butterfield on The West Wing. I asked Casey how he does it. We look at their mannerisms, their, their state of hygiene, their living conditions, whether they're carrying on a cohesive conversation, whether the thoughts are organized. We make all these behavioral analysis as we're talking to them, and uh, we form the diagnostic impression on that. And the diagnostic impression is all we need, just a, just a little impression. We, we're not trying to make a, a clear diagnosis. We're just kind of getting an impression on what's going on. That's a non-prescriptive set of non-trivial tasks, and it's intended to be. Civil libertarians are rightly concerned that without rigorous standards, Police could, for example, rouse the homeless into situations where they're confined just for being homeless. So every weekday, BIU goes out and patrols. Sometimes they're checking up on their clients, seeing how they are. They listen to the radio for calls that might have a mental health component. Even a domestic dispute might qualify, depending on what's coming over the radio. Sometimes they're taking radio calls from dispatch specifically for them. The most common call is a suicidal person. They have expressed to someone, sometimes over social media, sometimes texting others that they're suicidal and thinking about hurting themselves, killing themselves. And this is the part where it gets hard. We regularly hear in the media reports about how cops get it wrong. And the cost of being wrong is really high. It's often someone being injured or killed. We're talking about a group of officers whose job it is not to confront the mentally ill on the street, but to seek them out. That's fraught with challenges. As soon as they make a mistake, experts and parents will be saying, understandably, how upset they are that the cops got it wrong. 
Here's the most constructive example I could find. Professor Megan Ryan from Southern Methodist University.